Thanks for having me. This is, uh, should be kind of fun, I hope. Um, this is a procedure that you guys hopefully will all become uh, familiar with and feel competent doing because you actually can save someone's vision uh, if you do this in a timely manner. Uh, the reason why we do a lateral canthotomy and cantholysis, and that's actually the critical part of it, uh, is for a situation where a patient comes in with what's called an orbital compartment syndrome. In the ED setting, the most likely cause is going to be a trauma causing a retrobulbar hematoma or hemorrhage. And so the orbit is really a confined space. So if there's bleeding in the orbit, that's going to cause a compartment syndrome. Um, and what happens is the pressure from behind the eyeball is pushing the eyeball anteriorly, but you have your eyelids, which are preventing the eye from being able to move anteriorly. So those are pushing the eye posteriorly. And the eyeball itself gets sort of squished in the middle there. <clears throat> and that increase in pressure in the eye can cause uh, central retinal artery occlusion because uh, the retina can't be perfused because of that increased pressure, or an optic nerve uh, ischemic event, both of which can cause severe irreversible vision loss. What are the signs of a orbital compartment syndrome? Periorbital edema or swelling, obviously. The eye may already look somewhat proptotic or uh, protruding uh, anteriorly. If the patient is conscious, if they're describing a loss of vision, um, an objective sign would be a, an, affer an afferent pupillary defect. So you have to do the swinging flashlight test to check the pupil. Um, and a critical one is also the eye pressure. If you feel comfortable with a tono pen and able to check the eye pressure, um, there's some debate about what would be considered high enough to perform the canthotomy cantholysis but I would say anywhere in the range of 30 to 40, strongly consider it. <clears throat> if the patient isn't conscious and can't tell you about their vision, um, <clears throat> then the main points are um, some proptosis, an APD, and high eye pressure. Okay, so those are the sort of the three critical uh, exam findings to look at. You don't want to send the patient to uh, the CT scanner to look for a retrobulbar hematoma before performing this procedure if you think this procedure may be necessary. So you want to be able to make the decision clinically before getting radiologic studies. <clears throat> Important point, if you're ever questioning whether you should do it or not, just do it, <laughs> really. You're, you're going to be much better off doing it when maybe you didn't need to than not doing it when you should have, okay? So what are the steps? Um, <clears throat> the first step is you'd like to give the patient some local anesthetic, but essentially you want to localize at the lateral canthus. So you would draw up and you would inject really just under the skin, okay? And the lateral canthus is where the upper and lower eyelid meet at the uh, lateral angle here. What you don't want to do when you're injecting local near the eye is point the needle towards the globe. So always be aware that the patient may jerk their head in one direction or the other and have the needle situated in such a way that your hand can move with the globe and not have the needle go into the, uh, excuse me, move with the head and not have the needle go into the globe, okay? So you can even come from this angle if you have to, okay? Just you don't want the needle aimed towards the globe. If you can give the patient something systemic, if they have IV access, that's great because usually these patients are pretty inflamed around the orbit and the local is not going to work that well. Um, once you've anesthetized them, these are the only three pieces of equipment you need. <coughs> um, a straight hemostat, a pickup of some sort, and a scissor, okay? And you can do the canthotomy cantholysis. So once the patient is numb, the next step is to perform uh, what we call crush hemostasis. So you get your hemostat open, and you're going around <coughs> full thickness here, around the lateral canthus, and you're going to clamp, okay? Can everyone see that? Okay, and you clamp it all the way down and just let it sit for about 30 seconds. And this is, again, providing crush hemostasis in the area where you're going to cut. <coughs> so once you leave that clamp for a little bit, you unclamp it, and you'll see the crush marks in the skin. And the next step is the canthotomy, okay? So the canthotomy is basically cutting through the skin and the orbicularis muscle. And the point of the canthotomy is to gain access to the tendon, okay, to, to be able to form the inferior cantholysis. So the first step is 
<coughs> you're basically going to do the, again, the scissor should be full thickness. One blade completely behind the uh, eyelid skin and muscle there and one blade on the external surface and you snip. Okay, and that's your um, canthotomy. You can go a little bit further back, maybe about a centimeter. <coughs> and then the next step is the cantholysis. So what you want to do next is take your pickup and you want to grab the eyelid full thickness. So <coughs> I got a good grasp on the eyelid. And you want to pull the eyelid not north or south, but anteriorly towards the ceiling. Because that's <coughs> where the resistance from the tendons coming in and you can feel it. So again, this is an important point. A lot of people mistake either pulling north towards the eyebrow or south. And it's much harder to find the tendon pulling the eyelid those directions. So you want to go towards the ceiling. And you can take your scissor and <coughs> sort of go in underneath where you're picking up and strum. And you should be able to feel the tendon while you're strumming your scissor left and right. And when you feel pretty confident where it is, you just open your scissor over the tendon and snip. And that should really loosen up the eyelid. And you should feel it right away. It'll, mo it'll move towards the ceiling much more easily. And that's the whole procedure right there. Um, <coughs> if once you do that, that should provide a good decompression of the orbit and hopefully allow reperfusion to the uh, vital structures behind the eye, the retina and the optic nerve. Now to, ver to <coughs> verify that, you're going to want to check the eye pressure. So let's say the initial pressure was 45. You'd like to see the pressure come down into the 20s, okay, after this procedure. So if it's still high, you have the opportunity to then also perform a superior cantholysis. So we, we disinserted the lower eyelid, which gave us some decompression, but you can do the same exact procedure on the upper, upper eyelid, okay? Um, questions? Is there any long-term <coughs> damage uh, or recovery? From the eyelid yeah. procedure? Really uh, minimal. Um, a lot of times, surprisingly enough, these things will heal up on their own and they don't even need a uh, eyelid repair surgery. Occasionally they do and it's a relatively basic uh, eyelid procedure for us. So it's an outpatient, you know, 45 minute surgery to fix it.